All right, folks, we are on to our final week with Randy Cummings here with me in Texas. The last thing we were going to talk about was what larger farms do at scale. That's maybe more business oriented, maybe more seasoned, maybe more, you know, we've been in business for 30 years, uh, long term, maybe even some investor money, whatever the case may be, this is what farms who were directly set up as a business, a big business, and by big, that's relative, right? We're not talking about gigantic tractors and combines and commodity crops. Right. We're talking about, I think in this case, we're going to go into a lot of like bigger hydro stuff. Sure. Maybe some non-Salinas Valley crops. Yep. Regional folks, whatever. So the very first thing I, th- I think is you had something good in the outline about these farms are not built by accident in the locations in which they're at. No, and I, I think that's a something for a new uh, inspired uh, gardener that wants to start farming. Um, that's probably the biggest takeaway, right? These large greenhouses, um, they've been planned. Their locations are not accidents. So um, there might be situ- situated next to a major highway for distribution reasons. Um, they may be looking at competition in their market, uh, in various marketplaces and, and demand. Um, they may be looking at um, latitude. So if we're running a greenhouse and we're going to need um, to use some supplemental lighting, um, what's the advantage of having it more south with shorter days um, versus, um, you know, more northern and maybe needing more, uh, having more heating costs to, you know, heat the greenhouse. So labor distribution um operating costs um opportunity and demand and and population of metropolitan areas are all factored into these decisions of when we're going to build uh 4 acres worth of greenhouse or more are they are we looking at Los Angeles are we looking at Houston are we looking at um you know New York City Washington DC where are we going to put this thing um and i think that's something that a even a, a quarter acre single acre five acre grower may want to consider they may have uh 10 acres behind their house already but that doesn't necessarily that mean that that makes good farmland and it also doesn't necessarily mean that um that's the the best location for getting a product to market or getting it to um you know restaurants or you you may want to build your farm in a different town, in a different county, or even on a different street. Um, I think there's a lot to be said about the availability of utilities, sanitation. Water, you know, water quality. Are there any abatements mm-hmm. for taxes? How well the city is willing to work with that farm? You could move from one side of a big metropolitan area to the other, still service the middle but maybe have a vastly different outcome. Sure. Uh, It could be difference in in labor costs or labor force or or talent. Proximity to a highway certainly helps some regard. The other thing that there's built-in mechanisms in which food safety, certifications, regulations can all be addressed, managed. Maybe you have a compliance officer. And that's, that's a big one for me is having... A full-time compliance officer, and I see this at a lot of uh, the cannabis farms we visit. Mm-hmm. There is one person, not necessarily there to make friends, but like we are going to make sure that we do every I across every T dot every I. We're going to be in compliance. We're not going to get shut down. We're not going to get a fine. We're not going to risk the business sure. over cutting corners or missing something on accident. Yeah. And and these best practices are are good to think about really at any scale, but. I think a lot of it has to do with the um, where they're distributing their product, right? So as a grower, you might be servicing five restaurants, um, whereas uh, one of these, you know, large scale greenhouses might be serving 30 grocery stores or, you know, Cisco or whatever. And 
And what we start to see is when you start selling at that level, we need to start thinking about, um, you know, insurance. And okay, so now that insurance um, might mean that you need to have a checks and balances in place for, um, you know, food safety. You might need a country of origin on where your products are coming from. You might need uh, lots that are logged. So if there's a, you know, an E. coli or salmonella or listeria breakout or something, um, and it traces back to that grocery store, tracing back to that greenhouse, um, they can then trace it back to their seed supplier, their fertilizer water manufacturer, where, what water source, wherever it happens to be. And that process is, is in place now. I mean, anyone could do that as long as your farm is uh, logging that information at your level to say, here's my seed lot. Here's my, um, you know, I bought compost from Vermont Compost. This is that load number. And if there's ever an issue, you could say, here's the seed I use. Here's the compost I use. Here's the day we washed that tray. Here's the day we propagated it. And then it ties back to some of that, that record keeping. And those things are all entirely possible. They might not be relevant at your scale today, but that's what these, these and, and it's better to get into the habit now than this is certainly, I've been in places in my own companies for sure, where we've reached that level, but I've had long-term employees that are used to doing it a certain way. And now, Hey, surprise. Now we got to do paperwork. It's very hard to get buy-in on something new, sure. on something that's established. And a lot of times they don't see the need for it. It's not up to them to see a need for it. You're the farm owner. There is a need, whether they understand it or not. It's part of their job now. Sure. So, But it's much easier to do that from the beginning as you scale up because a compliance officer can't do it all. Right. And and it's one of those things where you, you hit that certain scale. and And we're talking about this not – to scare people away that this is the barrier of entry, but to understand how to level up. You know, we, we talk about that. The direct comparison is a lot of times people, and, and you see this at the farmer's market, especially where, well, the grocery store is selling a tomato for X, Y, Z. How are we going to compete? And the answer is you're not because that company is doing things at the level that we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. So just understanding, you know, keep your enemies close, right? Sure. If you're viewing that as a competition mindset, knowing why they are the way they are and knowing how they operate, being able to steal the best practices while leaving behind all the red tape that you may not have to deal with sure. is a great way to now start scaling up your business. Yeah. Uh, here's a perfect example of that, right? So that tomato, that head of lettuce has been signed off on by the quality control team, the head grower. R&D and their sales staff and the produce buyer at Publix or wholesale or, you know, um, your wherever, local chain here, your local chain, whatever that happens to, to be. Right. So where these farms aren't nimble is we've talked about supply issues, seed shortages, how fragile seed production can be um, due to various factors. So. Hey, that tomato that's been signed off on is and is under contract, and um, they have to produce X number of pounds a week. Um, they can't just sub in a different round red tomato because it's on average an ounce lighter or a shade more pink than red, or you know, slightly softer skin and might be more prone to bruising. Um, they have specs and they have to stay within that spec or um go through that approval process all over again so that i guess is an advantage for the smaller grower uh, hey my favorite tomatoes out of stock here's my second favorite here's my third favorite and or, you'll still have a tomato at market or what are you cooking for dinner tonight this tomato is better for sauce this tomato is <laughs> better for slicing um yeah that, you know that's another thing i, I think John and Jane Q. Public, a tomato is a tomato. Not knowing that some are made sure. for sauces, some are made for slicing, some are made for salads. I think this is a, a story. It's a little off topic, but a story we're sharing, right? Like On this podcast, we're getting off topic. <laughs> uh, you know, 
I'm not a tomato connoisseur. I'm I'm not a fan of of tomatoes personally. But working previously for a seed company and if you want a quality tomato and you want to understand the the tomato market, it's interesting to talk to a seed company from Italy, right? And there uh there's some you know, at one point, our our company was was visited by by uh, Sace, who's a tomato breeder out of out of Italy. And I they thought you were going to say Chef Boyardee <laughs> for a minute. They've got they've got uh, fantastic products, but they they someone in from that that culture they eat tomatoes with every meal. So there is no one tomato. There's you know a sweet tomato, a sour tomato, kind of like the Eskimo word for for, word for snow, right? Sure, it, 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 there you go. Uh, that's perfect, right? So when you're eating a tomato for every meal, there's um, there's all these different characteristics. You know, is it going into you know a uh, a salad? Is it going on a burger? Is it um, is it just being eaten on a piece of toast with your eggs in the morning? That's a fascinating concept for someone that's just coming into the industry for the first time um that there's not a tomatoes not a tomatoes not a tomato um similar story doing carrot trials we had recently hired on um in a in a previous role we had hired on a uh, a breeder and he walked me through how to do taste tests on carrots and there was a procedure because you know you have to cleanse the palate so we would eat we would take a carrot, we would slice it up, and we would sample it from different parts of the carrot. So the tip of the carrot may taste different than the, the top of the carrot. And we would take and we would eat peanuts after each, each variety because it was a texture difference. And it kind of reset the palate. And so these things have taste, they have mouthfeel, they have... Um, after texture, aftertaste, some are have more tarpanoids and 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 have that soapy flavor to them. So all of that to say, um, someone who's not familiar with the industry, or as I said, buys a a generic carrot packet off the spinning rack at their hardware store. Um, there's so much more to that based on what you're actually looking for, and I know that's. That's off topic. But, oh, I love uh, it. I mean, that's why we do what we do is for those stories. So the other thing that these big farms have that, while not unique to the big farms, I think they approach it in a vastly different way, and that is their media strategy, and I'm going beyond social media, sure. and their public relations strategy, where you had the analogy that the story is the byproduct of whatever food factory situation is going on. So... I'm going to have you go into that, and then I'll talk about how I view things from a media sure. standpoint and from a PR standpoint and what the difference is. Sure. So I've, I've worked with a lot of, you know, larger hydro uh, operations, and it's... You ever, you ever sign an NDA? More often than not. And that, you know, um, will limit some of the things I can talk about, but it there's some overarching um, similarities that certainly aren't unique or proprietary to them, right? So more often than not, we see on their label that they're they're claiming pesticide free, spray free, chemical free, GMO free. GMO free. Um all, all of the above. And some of these things are really um they they should go without saying, right? Um that when we can control the environment and we can prevent, we can exclude bugs and pests from getting into the greenhouse. It's pretty easy to then not have to spray, to spray pesticides. Um, so being able to claim spray free um, when they might not be able to claim organic, they're not, they may not be using organic seed. They may not be using, um, it's hard to get organic nutrient in a system like that. It's not possible, but it's it's pretty difficult. That's a way that they can um, they can make that claim, which is absolutely true, um, and still have their end consumer feel good about it. So you'll see these bright bright colored green labels um, with all of these things, and certainly a grower can make uh, any any grower can make these claims too if they're 
you know, not spring anything on the product. Um, they're not buying one of the, you know, seven or nine crops or whatever it is that could potentially fall in that GMO category or the organic or whatever um, to say, hey, yeah, we're, we're spray free, we're, we're chem free, we're uh, non GMO, even though there's no such thing as a GMO lettuce. For instance, it's not a crop that's being worked on in a GMO space. There are no GMO markers for it. Um, it tends to be open pollinated by, you know, inherently, they're still making that claim, even though they don't need to. Well, and it could be argued that they may need to because every dietitian and scientist and CNN and name the media outlet sure. has scared everybody into thinking GMOs are so prevalent. And that every single one is just the devil. And I'm sure, I, like, <clears throat> I've, I have seen studies. I have my own opinion of it. Sure. Sure, it's different than what a lot of other people are going to have. That's okay. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not picking a side here. Um, and are they pre- prevalent? Yes, they're you know, GMO and, and modified, you know, corn for corn syrup and things like that is is prevalent. It's in the, the gum you chew. It's in the, um, could be in your, your, one of the ingredients in your dog food. You know, it could be um, this, that, or that. It's hard to avoid. With that said, should you be eating McDonald's anyway? <laughs> should you be <laughs> eating McDonald's anyway? Or um, it's not prevalent. It's prevalent in Corn, soybeans, sugar beets, some rare, you know, unique varieties of of zucchini and and summer squash for, you know, disease resistance, Um, alfalfa, um, you know, things. Soybeans. What's that? Soybeans. Soybeans, yep. Canola or or rapeseed, I think. Um, A lot of things that are used in, in animal feed, not peppers, not tomatoes. Not cucumbers, not lettuce, not juniper bushes. Judge. <laughs> so I, there's so many people that are that are either on super high alert. Um, they're not alert on the gum they chew. That has that may have it, but they're hyper alert on their vegetables. That half of them are typically used for for animal feed, and and you wouldn't come. You wouldn't interact with it at a farmer's market, a grocery store, um, produce aisle, a grocery store produce aisle. It's it's tough to tell that story in a 30 second interaction with a customer at the farmer's market booth. But when you also have to decide, to your point at lunch, is it on you to, quote unquote, correct somebody? Sure. Especially in a public setting, especially with somebody. They're not going to believe you anyway. So it it's easier to uh, for some people it's easier to just say smile and nod, smile and nod, or say our product our our lettuce isn't GMO, even though there's no such thing at this time of, as a GMO lettuce, right? So it goes back to these these large factory farms that are this is their brand, their messaging is they're painting the picture that this is a nutrient superior product. Um, because it's not GMO. They're painting the picture that um, they're conserving water when that is a national and global concern. And they're painting the picture that they're bringing food um, to food deserts and people in need. And and that's the conversation. And while those... Providing things, jobs. Providing jobs. And while those things certainly are happening and are true... That's not necessarily the mission. The mission is to be profitable selling, you know, selling a product. And they can you say that again? Seriously, say it again. The their their mission is to sell produce. You know, to sell a product. The to what end? To make a profit. To make a profit. Um, to run their sustainably their profit sustainable farm. Right. So it. It it just it interests me that we're they're painting it from that lens that um you know it's 
again, yes, it's true. They may use less water. Uh, they recirculate water. Um, the food's nutritious, but it should be the assumption that all all vegetables are nutritious, right? You know, it's funny. They don't say, uh, you know, this lettuce is not testable on, on animals. <laughs> it, but you could. You sure. Know, to, it's the same damn thing. Where do you thing. draw the line, right? Yeah. Where do you... And look, let's just be super clear. These larger far- farms that are largely VC funded, big investor funded, mm-hmm. something like that. It's okay to have a business while saving water. Sure. While not doing GMOs, while providing jobs. It's not one or the other. Right. It goes back to the the conversation you could have about, you know, the farm to table movement. I'm not going to get into that here because I have a whole talk coming up in a few weeks about this particular little gym, but farm to table what is the reality of it? What has been painted before us that now farmers have to navigate a bunch of false realities in order to confirm to conform to what people believe farm to table to be mm-hmm. and it's completely false or it's to your point, yeah, it's not GMOs, but why are we having to say it? Why why are we it, it should be implied. Right. You know, and and maybe in a perfect world, and I guess they could say we're stepping all over each other. Sure, but it could be the system is so damn broken. This is the only way to get through to people. We we have such short attention spans, right? So uh, to to put that bullet point on that just sweeps by the whole conversation, um, whether it's needed or not. Like it, uh, I was trying to say, you know, in a perfect world, for those that are concerned about GMOs, um, maybe we should be in an environment where rather than declare something isn't, maybe we should have to de- declare when it is. And that gets rid of all this other um, scare um, on lettuce, on basil on tomatoes and peppers that just doesn't exist because it's not a thing. Um, Maybe it helps eliminate the uh, argument between organic certified and hydro-organic certified. Is that a thing? Could it be a thing, you know, in this little bit of infighting that you sometimes see within agriculture? And 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 I'm not I don't want to paint the picture that these uh factory farms um are are evil. I because I, inherently I don't think they are. I think any time we can diversify our supply chain, you know, food source, um, not put all our eggs in the basket on, you know, a very large percentage of our food coming out of California that has wildfires and droughts and rapidly evolving uh, plant disease pressure. I... I'm glad that these local, even factory farms are popping up. If, it, if people eat more lettuce because of it, great. If people eat more herbs because of it, great. But I think the message back to a smaller scale grower, and I've said this time and time again, um, play to your strengths, right? It's incredibly hard to grow lettuce in the summer. You got to start worrying about shade cloth. You got to worry about drip tape. You got to worry about maybe white plastic mulch that uh, can reflect some heat. Um, you got to buy, you know, best in class varieties that are heat tolerant. Um, and those things are all certainly doable. And you can charge a premium for your product for that. But let's not forget that. Um, it, and, and to try to compete with those guys, but they're not going to compete with you on a carrot. They're or, not competing with anybody because they already have the contracts. They're not coming to the sure, farmer's absolutely. market. They're, they're they're not going to the, the restaurants and having relationships with the chefs one-on-one. Correct. They're selling thousands of heads to Albertsons, HEB, Subway, Ex- what, that's exactly Sam's it. Club, whatever. And, and where where else would that product come from? It's not going to come from you anyway. It's not going to come from you anyway. It's California, Mexico, uh, some other country. Um, so I don't see those as competitions. I, if truly, if you are worried about it, like I said, 
they'll never grow a better tasting carrot than you can. They'll never grow. Um, they'll never be able to have the diversity of products that you offer. You're going to have a hard time growing a nicer looking head of lettuce than they are. Sometimes it let them do it. You know, they're not going to be at your farmer's market with the booth. And by and large, neither are their customers. By, I agree. Agreed. Uh, let's take a look at some of the strategies they would employ from uh, media. And then I think this is the important part. Also, the uh, public relations um, firm or division of the company. Now, a lot of folks, they'll think public relations and media is one and the same. It's vastly different. They're going to have a marketing department that you're going to find that these folks have relatively few followers and all of the metrics that we would associate with a successful market farmer because they're not pandering to the same type of audience. Sure. The only thing they need to do is use social media as a checklist box to get people to their website, but more importantly, so their account representatives have something to point to and say, you can find us here. Sure, sure. Um, I think they're, you know, their their end goal may be different. So I'm not sure what good it does to drive people to their website anyway, right? So you're not going to buy a head lettuce from them off their website. You know, they're talking to produce buyers. And by that, I mean um, grocery stores. Let's let's you know. let's give the example of of Landry's. Okay, so Landry's is a restaurant group. Uh, Saltgrass, hell, I can't. I don't eat at them, so I don't know. But sure. I know that Landry's has a ton of different restaurants all over the country. They are Landry's as big as they are are not buying from these places. Sure. They're getting them from the distributors. So the only people that farms account reps are talking to are. Benny Keith, Cisco, U.S. Wholesale, possibly Sam's Club, Costco, H-E-B as a, or, sure. you know, who, whatever well, regional chain, whatever, Publix. Yeah. Whatever flavor of yeah. regional yeah. you have. So think of single point distribution centers, truckloads of lettuce that are then further getting distributed by their own mechanisms mm -hmm. from the people they're selling to. So they may only have four, five, six clients, and each one of them pays several million dollars a year. Exactly. And they buy their product before it's even grown, and they've got contracts, and their business is only set up to do that. So, you know, if they are charging that distribution chain 80 cents a head for lettuce, and I don't even know what it is, but... um they don't have the structure to put someone at a farmer's market and truck, a, you know, 10 coolers of lettuce there. And, you know, their model works because they put 40 cases of lettuce on a pallet. It goes in a reefer truck and they never see it again. You know, um, so it's... I wouldn't I wouldn't consider them uh a threat. I don't I certainly don't consider them evil. Um I think there are things we can learn from them though. Um so one might be talking about branding and packaging. Um when you go to the grocery store and you see their their well designed label and you like that product or you didn't, it's more easy to remember. And when you go back to the grocery store next week, um you can associate yourself with that with that label and and say I liked that last time or I didn't like that or um, I'm going to try something else. That's it's a bit harder to do at a farmers market. So you're at a farmers market and your lettuce gets put in a clear plastic bag uh, or a paper bag or whatever it is, um, and so do six other vendors at that farmers market, but. If you can find a way to put a label on that bag, it might cost you 12 more cents on that bag. But you're standing out. You're standing out. And when you're 
your customer knows how to find you again because they remember. Is that a head of lettuce or is that Carl Banger's Parish Natural Farms head of lettuce? Exactly. You got it. So it's incredibly important to come up with that logo, um, have that packaging, have that. And, and I'm not saying be wasteful in the packaging. You know, you can still have environmentally conscious packaging, um, but put that logo on your tent awning, put it on a tablecloth in front of your, your thing, uh, have a business card or, or have, have a stamp made up where you can stamp it on that paper bag, you know, a rubber stamp and just crank them out. If that's what it takes, that's what it takes, but do something to stand out, um, and help your customers find you again. So the public relations bit is doubtful that they would have somebody full-time employed, but what they do have is a public relations agency that they're represented by. And what happens, especially on startup or especially during a wildfire event or a food shortage or an E. coli outbreak, these PR firms have the relationships within larger and regional media, think television, think newspapers, think magazines, to go, hey, we can help tell this story from a food perspective standpoint, from a labor standpoint, from a, we're creating jobs, from we're doing a sustainable thing, we are saving water. Sometimes it's a puff piece, sometimes it's a direct um, example of what a local company i.e. one of these big ones is doing to combat X, Y, or Z national food issue. It's much different than how do we get an ad set done? How do we do a commercial? How do we do this? It's this is not to get more business. However, this is awareness that may help us on the next funding round as we build location two. Mm -hmm. Also, these PR firms are employed Let's say we have a lot number that has a listeria outbreak. That factory somehow is to blame, however unlikely. The PR firm is going to help their media team, their board of directors, navigate the media shitstorm that's fixing to hit. Sure. How are we going to admit fault, take responsibility, this is what we're going to do in the future, this is what we're doing to help those affected. This is what we're doing for our uh, business partners mm -hmm. that we're selling to, to just reassure everybody. It's something that companies have to do. It's like, again, in this litigious society, everybody has a voice. Sure. Everybody can make a claim. It's real easy to form a mob these days, right? Sure. So you need somebody that does this on a regular basis. I mean, look, you as a farmer, this board of directors at this big hydro place, they're all just, at the end of the day, trying to grow ahead of lettuce, right? Right. No matter how they're doing it, who they're selling it to, at the end of the day, they're not focused on what exact script needs to be said that we don't further get ourselves in hot water. Yeah. So if you're thinking about how they are setting up their business to protect themselves like that, maybe you don't as a small farmer need to do that, but how as you, as a small farmer, could do your own reach out to your local uh, newspaper, your regional news outlet. How do you get on the news to tell your story that you're also creating, maybe it's creating two jobs and not 200, but still creating jobs? Sure. How are you building a pollinator habitat for your diversified farm that does honey and bees and eggs? And then, hey, feel good story. Supplying local food at your farmer's market. Come see us this weekend. It, it's something to think about. And that's how these people that you see, whether they're your neighbors or they're these big, whether it's village farms, this is how they're getting on the news is they're reaching out. Absolutely. And it, it goes back to a previous conversations we've had about collaboration. Like even let's talk about opportunities to collaborate with a chef, right? How do you get the chef out to your farm? How do you get you as a as a farmer as a guest of honor at the restaurant how do you get your farm name printed on their menu um you know how do you get both of your photos together in the paper you know in your in your local town you know these are all things that that you can do um i think it's worthwhile to um 
go back to something you had mentioned about, you know, Listeria, E. coli, um, Salmonella type outbreaks in, in these facilities. And I, I think it's helpful for someone that might not be as, as familiar with some of the scale that a lot of these, um, you know, factory farms are operating at is they've done a lot to mitigate those risks from being almost entirely or sometimes entirely touch free, hands free, where, uh, you know, someone in a lab coat with a hairnet and gloves opens the seed packet, dumps it into a, um, a vacuum seeder or a drum roller seeder, and the product is seeded into trays automatically by robots. Product flows through um, in, into a tray or a raft into a deep water culture pond system. And as that plant matures, it floats down that pond and replaced by another raft and replaced by another raft. And when it gets to the end of the, the pond or the racetrack or whatever terminology you want to use for it, assembly line, it's a fully grown plant 30 days later, 20 days later, 50 days, whatever it happens to be. And either someone with gloves picks that plant up, puts it in a clamshell, or a robot arm will pull that plant out, automatically put it in a clamshell, dump that clamshell in a case of 12 or whatever it is. And it's had little to no interaction with human hands. So from a food safety standpoint, they've it's extremely hard for that plant to come in contact with E. coli, salmonella, or listeria because it's never been touched. It's also most likely being harvested in a pre-refrigerated area, yep. going directly into refrigerated yep. storage, and shipped in a refrigerated truck. And exactly, and so, and in some cases, even taking the seed itself and having each and every single lot lab tested independently for E. coli, salmonella, and listeria. So they can say the product going in is sterile or, you know, pathogen free and has never been touched by a set of human hands until it gets to, until the consumer pops that clamshell open. So I, I share that story um, simply for growers to understand if they consider that competition. What are they truly up against? That's what they're up against. Um, and that's one of the advantages when they're selling to Publix, Albertsons, Whole Foods, Cisco, whatever, is um, it's a lot easier for that grocery store or food hub or distribution model um, to have confidence in that product that it's not going to make their consumer sick. It's not going to jack their insurance or liability up. Um, and that could be a barrier entry for uh, Joe Farmer. Well, and if you think about what grocery stores are faced with, think about their main liability would be just general people walking in the store and slipping and falling on sure. a wet floor. Second would be beef or dairy or dairy or beef in one of those orders. And then produce. Yep. If you're going to get sick, it's going to be, if you're going to get sick or hurt in a store, it's going to be one of those four things. Either a slip and fall, meat, Dairy. Yep. And, and, you know, it's, it goes back to for a while, like, um, sprouts was, was like a taboo word to say, right? Because you're talking about a product that's sold with roots still on, the seed health still on. If there happens to be any minute E. coli, salmonella listeria in seed form, it's highly concentrated. All, what little there is is concentrated into a very small plant, so it's in a higher ratio, right? Um, there's more risk than a three foot tall, you know, pepper plant having that. Um, I've often thought about where microgreens would be had it not been for some of those outbreaks in sprouting. It's it's almost a force the necessity to have, sure, you know, a different growing technique. It makes me cringe a little bit to see some 
Um, some people still, you know, market their product with the seed hills still on as a as a a crunch factor, or or it can be dangerous. I guess my final thought would be take a look at some long multi generation legacy farms. These people started small. They grew. They're serving agriculture in the way in which their family came out. Think about these larger, you know, multi-acre greenhouses serving specific metropolitan hubs in a way that's arguably questionable or, or arguably better for the environment than some other methods. They are employing jobs. Uh, a lot of them are higher paying jobs because there's a lot of specialties that go into this. It is supplying a group of people that typically you would not be supplying anyway. Compare and contrast that with your own farm. There's a space for everybody. Mm -hmm. Don't be the farmer that maybe gets on the bandwagon and negatively beats up somebody else in agriculture. Because just imagine how you would feel if one of these big hydro stores actually took the time to even worry about you, which they're not, go, well, small farming is uh, inherently unsafe because typically there's not a lot of checks. Uh, you can go to the farmer's market relatively without a lot of the certifications or insurance. They're not being monitored 24-7. They're not doing these lots. There's a lot of things they could say that they don't. So nobody wants to buy from anybody negative. Respect them for what they are. Sure. Take their best practices. Incorporate that into your own operation. They've spent all this money figuring stuff out. Take what you can, scale it down appropriately, and man, get after it. Right? Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. I I think at the end of the day, there's there's really not competition because um, the markets they're serving is um, it's so different. The barriers of entry for a lot of growers to get to that point um, are, are are quite high. And like I said, we can all play to our strengths. Learn best practices. Take, as you said, take what you can. And uh, sample that buffet of knowledge, right? Right. Well, the last few weeks having you here on the podcast, or in our case, a very long day, has been fantastic. I think we've been able to just really carve up and dive deep on some topics we've covered before, but we're shedding a new line on it. We're going a little bit deeper. Um, and I think we're making a lot of connection points between how all of this stuff is interplayed and how it all affects each other, um, you know, down from the seed source to what we just talked about, you know, what's your local market looking like, um, uh, looking forward to seeing you in the future. It, this is, this is super fun. I, I, I love Nick that we can have these types of discussion anyway, so. Again, if it saves someone, um, if someone can learn from it, um, if they want to participate in the dialogue and, and, and comment or, or share an idea or give us an idea to, to talk about that can help them, uh, fantastic. And I look forward to, to being able to participate in chat more in the future. Excellent. Well, if you want to talk to Randy, give us a call sometime. He'll be available. And uh, see you on the flip. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. All right, folks, this is our uh, big podcasting day with Randy. Had a little bit of time left over. I thought I would do a speed round so we can just get to know Randy a little bit better. Um, Randy's a long-winded, beautiful fella. I, I'm scared right now. Yeah, yeah. This, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm springing this on him uh, unannounced. So keep him short, but not too short. So we'll see what happens. We'll, we'll, we've never done this before. I'm interested to see what happens. Uh, what is a time that you went to visit a farmer in all these years that you had a big aha moment? Just somebody totally blew your mind. Hmm. Probably the visiting a grower up in Canada blew my mind when we were selling them a little bit uh previous company I worked for previously selling them a little bit of cucumber seed 
And when we showed up, we saw dump trucks coming out of the field full of peppers. Dump track after dump. Just the scale um, blew my mind. I had, I had never seen anything like that um, before. Um, honestly, the the aha moment, I, I think that also kind of blew my mind, was actually visiting your farm uh, in Paris all those years ago, Nick, and seeing that um, kind of salad CSA model and your system and how you were putting that together was super smart in, in my, you know, in my experience. I just, I had never seen anything like that. Um, that distribution model uh, was, was super interesting. And um, again, you're already doing 90% of those things when you're growing anyway. So that extra 10% uh, to expand the market, super smart. What was the and you can enter in your own word, but what was the craziest farm visit that you ever had that you maybe walked away from going, well, we won't do that again. <laughs> um, I won't name names. Of course. Visited a farm down in Texas. This tracks. Visited, <laughs> visited a farm down, and this one's not Nick. Visited a farm down in Texas. Customer, the owner, said, hey, can, do you want a tour? I said, yep. We hopped in his Nissan pickup truck. And we toured. He he put on uh, uh, an Ozzy Osbourne song. Cranked it up. And we drove through the fields at about 70 miles an hour. In that pickup truck, bombing through the field. <laughs> we toured that farm in about 52 seconds. And he was a little disappointed that it wasn't his personal record. <laughs> <laughs> we, had, we had a laugh. We went inside. We, we chatted more. But uh, it was hilarious. It was fun. It was a little scary. I think we clipped some tomato plants on the way by. Uh, drifting around one one corner of a field, but uh, that was a that was a unique one for me. What is the oldest old wives' tale you've ever heard? So you know, planting by the moonlight, that kind Ooh. of that kind of thing. I I think it goes back to something I've said before, which is I I have to I can only buy from a local seed company because their products are uh, acclimated to my region. I think it's probably the, the silliest thing I had, I had heard of. Um, there's so much seed that's produced in specific regions for a specific reason you, to control humidity, you know, substrate. And this is protect the seed, not the actual plant that's exactly. going to come out of it. Exactly, yeah. to, pr to, to protect the seed. So um, that one ranks up there for me. If I were to pull up your playlist right now, what are the three artists I would see? Right now, um, this has changed over the years. Right now, it's been a lot of uh, Tyler Childers. Um, I've been listening to a lot of folk mu music. So Tyler Childers, um, maybe Band of Horses, um, maybe, what else would you see? Um, sheesh. Um, Billy Strings, probably my top three right now. Good to know. Favorite farmer's market. This could be one that you go to, one that you've ever visited. Just something innovative. Doesn't matter. Just do you have a standout farmer's market that you wished you were that was in your hometown? And it could be your hometown one. I don't know. Hmm. The the so I'm I'm from Waterville, Maine. The, the I'd love to say the Waterville market. There's some great vendors there. Um, we've got some um, kind of uh, Amish made uh, pastries and and breads that are that are fantastic. Um, I love going down there uh, when I can. It's of course it's it's pretty small. You know we don't have a huge bustling area. Um, 
a farmer's markets are always kind of hit or miss for me in my experience because um, I want to go, I want to interact, I want to see what's going on, but um, I don't want to impede customers from making money in their one opportunity. So um, I know that doesn't really answer the question, but uh, I like them all. I like I like when there is some downtime, and I'm not going to disturb anyone to have that that individual conversation with the person uh, there. Sometimes it's the owner. And they want to talk, and they're super proud of their farm, as they should be. They want to talk and talk. Um, other times, it's one of the employees, and they just happen to be there for the afternoon and conversation stuff. But Favorite movie? Favorite movie. And I will allow different segments, if you so choose. Favorite movie. There's a handful up, uh, up there. Um, I guess the one freshest on my brain because I happened to see that it was on TV last night in the hotel room was uh, Tombstone. Nice. Uh, favorite city to visit? Favorite city to visit? I'm I'm a fan of uh, and we had talked about it, and it could was... it maybe it's not a city, maybe it's a place. Sure, sure, sure. Um. Uh, my favorite place to visit um, is in Rhode Island, and uh, my wife and I have some fantastic friends down there, um, and there's the Newport Folk Festival uh, every year, and so we go down, we visit with friends, we listen to some fantastic music. Um, our friends are gracious enough to open their home to about 20 people. Um, who we don't get to see because they're from all over the country. And we're just listening to music, have a great time, enjoy company. And uh, that's fantastic. So that's my that's my happy place um, for sure. Have any weird ticks? We got all kinds of ticks in Maine. But <laughs> um, the older I get, I start to get a little bit more of the, you know, old man, you know, get off my lawn syndrome. So I think it for me, it's for people that park on the street instead of parking their own driveways is a, is a little personal pet peeve for me. I think after you turn 45, other, other people's parking is a, is a big issue. <laughs> um, so I know you're more meat and potatoes as am I. However, what's your favorite vegetable? My favorite vegetable is a little out there, um, a, a couple, we'll say. Uh, I think my favorite is, whoa, I just remembered another. So Hawkeye turnips, the little sal white salad turnips mm -hmm. are my absolute favorite. You know, they're, they're juicy. I know a lot of people are against the word moist. <laughs> they're juicy. They're, um, you know, they're a, uh, picture a, like a, a radish that doesn't have any heat or, or spice, and it has a little bit more brassica type flavor. Also, a big fan of kohlrabi. Um, I could take a kohlrabi and just a knife and just uh, snack on it. Um, uh, those those two are probably uh, my favorite. But I also am a big fan of peas, sweet peas. If tomorrow you had to go farming for a living, mm, good one. What would you do? I would. I think it would be super cool to start a microgreen operation. Um, I think that would be my my go to. Um, however, I personally don't think I have a have the market for it in my town in my county. Um, there's just not enough demand. Um, I think opening some sort of uh, Airbnb or event center, sunflower maze, pick your own pumpkins, you know, photography, wedding venue type thing, um, may be my go-to. And if not that, my backup may be working hand-in-hand -hand with a farm and having a food truck. If you, uh, what's the number one place on your international bucket list to visit? I'd love to go. I've only, I'd love to go when the pandemic pandemic's over, go back someplace tropical like Jamaica. But I think, uh, the 
for my culture and not just sunny beach relax but um i think scotland and check out some of the castles over there and i'm i'm a big time nerd and geek and and love all that uh you know uh medieval stuff and i think that would just be super cool to to go go to and check out what's your biggest takeaway from this week biggest takeaway from this week um is i'm super excited and happy right when you when you leave a company that you've worked at for 11 years um and can come to another company where the customer energy is the same the process is fairly similar um it feels like home and not only does it feel comfortable and and home and take a bunch of that scary anxiety out of, of switching careers um the people I've met so far, the bootstrap staff is fantastic. The ownership's fantastic. Um, I'm super excited to work in a collaborative environment with a great quality product with a customer. There's nothing better than working with farmers, period. I don't, they're the best. So um, my takeaway this week is newfound energy, excitement, and already knowing that that i'm in a good place and i'm i can't wait to to just rock and roll what's the best advice you ever got best advice that comes to mind um comes from a a previous uh ceo at a former company i worked at that kind of took me um he was great at kind of taking people under his wing and really believed in in mentoring people and appreciating talent and starting to give them the tools to succeed. And, you know, he told me, he asked me, you know, what I wanted to do. And um, he said, look, you know, you can do the same job for 30 years and you can be a sales guy with 30 years of experience, but that doesn't bring you any more value than five to 10 years, you're going to be an expert in your field. So why not get five to 10 years of sales experience, five to 10 years of marketing experience, five to 10 years of product development experience, five to 10 years of, you know, make yourself more well-rounded. Once you've, once you've mastered something and you can say that you've, you've got that skill, find another one because that's, what's going to make you more valuable, um, and increase your network and, and, fill your cup and um and I think about that a lot 